All right, so in chapter four, we see Jesus leaving the populated areas of Jerusalem and Judea, and He returns northward to His hometown and area around uh, the Sea of Galilee, comes from that region, about 85 miles from Jerusalem you know, to, uh, uh, to the Sea of Galilee and those uh, regions. And on this particular journey, John recounts Jesus' encounter with an, a certain woman at a well, and in so doing, uh, again, you're going to see how he touches, once again, all the themes uh, in this particular scene. So let's go to uh, chapter four, beginning in verse one. So let's read that. It says, therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, Although Jesus Himself was not baptizing, but His disciples were, He left Judea and went away again into Galilee, and He had to pass through Samaria. Now, we discussed last week the idea that Jesus did not want to confront the Pharisees. Uh, he didn't want to do this so early in His ministry to avoid you know, public strife and uh, guarantee a future uh, you know, a safe access to the city. If, once he starts the confrontation with the leaders, he's going to have trouble moving about. So he's trying to keep his ministry a little more low key. Um, when he sees that they're attacking him, he leaves the capital city uh, area and he goes to kind of friendlier territory up north. Now in order to make the journey, he had to pass through what used to be the northern kingdom, but what was now called Samaria. The Samaritans were, and I think this is familiar to most of you, they were a half-breed or a mixed-race descendants of the Jews who had originally you know, inhabited the northern kingdom, the ten tribes of the northern kingdom. They'd been defeated in 722 BC by the Assyrians and they were scattered among pagan uh, nations. Uh, the Assyrians, that was their way of assimilating people. Uh, the Babylonians would leave you with your culture and so on and so forth and they would take the cream of the crop and, and bring them and train them in their ways and their thinking then send them back as your rulers. You know, that was their way to maintain conquered nations. The Assyrians, no. The Assyrians, they would take you and spread you among all the other nations to kind of water down your bloodline and if they watered down your bloodline, the thinking was it would also water down your zeal and the opportunity for a counter you know, an insurrection of some kind. So that's what had happened to the northern kingdom. Throughout the centuries, however, as people are wont to be, they had drifted back to repopulate the areas where the old northern kingdom used to be. Of course, they were no longer full-blooded Jews, having intermarried within foreign nations, but they still claimed Abraham as their ancestor, uh, as the Jews of the southern kingdom did as well. Now because they lived in the old region of, northern, of the northern kingdom with Samaria as its capital, they and the region were referred to as Samaritans. That's where that comes from. All right, so let's um, uh, read verses five and six. It says, so he came to a city of Samaria called uh, Sychar, or Shachar actually pronounced, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. So Samaria was once the capital of the northern kingdom, but by this time it had been reduced considerably. It didn't have its former glory. The well that is spoken of here is still there today. You can, still, you can visit it, it's still providing um, water. The, the thing, however, is it's inside a church building. They, they built a church building over the well and it becomes a pilgrim site now. Uh, it was located near the place where Joseph, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, was said to have had his uh, houses, uh, his bones buried after the, uh, after the Jews left Egypt and carried his remains with them. So the well you know, had uh, historical significance. Note that John describes Jesus as being tired from the journey that he was on. Just a little throwaway line, but there are no throwaway lines in the Bible. I mean, he's hot, he's tired, he's dusty, he's thirsty. Doesn't that sound like a human being's response after a long walk in the hot sun? You know, people say, well, Jesus wasn't really a man. Well, that sure describes a man, doesn't it? Now, this place was about 31 miles north of Jerusalem. 
So Jesus was probably on the second day of His journey north. It was noon, of course, the hottest time of the day, and if ever you've been in that area of the world, very, very hot. So he arrives at this cooling spot, he sits to rest before moving on. Now in order to understand more fully the amazing encounter Jesus has with this woman that he meets here, it's helpful to know how Jesus felt, or how the Jews rather, felt about Samaritans. In a word, they hated them because they were a mixed blood and therefore considered an impure race. They hated them because the Samaritans worshiped at Bethel. Now Bethel was a place of worship in the north established by the northern king Jeroboam long before in order to keep the people from going south to Jerusalem. When there was the, uh, the civil war and the, and the country broke up north and south, the north had more tribes, 10 tribes, the south only had two tribes, but Jerusalem was located in the southern kingdom. That's where the temple was. And of course, people would naturally you know, gravitate towards going to the temple. So the northern king, in order to stop that exodus, established another place of worship in Bethel for the people of the northern kingdom. So that's, that was one of the uh, uh, one of the contentious issues between north and south, and you'll see this point come up when he begins talking to the, uh, uh, to the woman. In addition to this, they, the northern or the Samaritans, they only accepted the first five books of the Bible as authentic, and they rejected the prophets. Of course, the hatred was mutual because the Jews had rejected the Samaritans' offer of help to rebuild the temple after the, you know, after the Jews came back, the southern Jews, after they came back from captivity in Babylon, they started rebuilding the temple and the people in the north uh, offered to help and the Jews of the south said, no way, you, you have no part of this. So uh, as we see today, people keep an offense a long time. You know what I'm saying? They're still fighting over this type of offense. So for this rejection and their superior attitude, the Jews had earned the reciprocal hatred of the Samaritans. And so into this town, Jesus ventures one day and he meets a Samaritan woman who herself was coming to draw water on a hot uh, noon day. And even that was unusual and we'll see that in a moment. Now I want you to note that the woman is drawing water at noon, an unusual time because the normal time for this would be in the evening. I want you to note also that she was alone, a fact that will have meaning as we learn more about her. So let's read verse seven and eight. It says, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Now, Again, it would be normal for a human being in this situation to ask for a drink. The amazing and ironic thing is that the fountain of life himself was asking for mere water. I mean, you know, it's just an amazing scene that you see there. He was traveling with his followers who had left him there to buy food, as John said, in, a, in another town. Verse nine, Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So what does she do? She rebuffs him. <laughs> she basically says, no, no drink for you. And she states that the social barriers that separate him, them precludes her from, from her serving him water. First of all, there was the man-woman barrier. Today, it's nothing. You talk to a woman, even a strange woman, and there's really, you know, nobody is offended. But in those days, you didn't, you know, a man didn't talk to a woman if she was alone. And a Jew and Samaritan, they also did not have good relations. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So Jesus responds now as the Son of God, not as the weary traveler, not as the thirsty man. He answers her by telling her that what he asks for is very small in comparison to what he, the Son of God, is able to give her. He offers living water, a concept that goes far beyond social custom and old rivalries, a spiritual gift 
described by using spiritual words. Actually, the term was used by Jeremiah in the Old Testament in warning the southern kingdom of its imminent destruction because of their sinful idolatry. Jeremiah referred to God who is the source of life and truth and light. He also referred to Him as the living water that would punish them for their sin. So that term comes from the Old Testament, from Jeremiah, and it's a, in reference to God Himself. So Jesus is saying, I'm offering you God. All right, he uses that term, but He's saying, I'm offering you God. Of course, J uh, uh, Jesus is saying that uh, uh, knowing Him and knowing the truth and obtaining the living water were all one and the same and it was all wrapped around Himself. The woman didn't see that right away, but that's what He was saying. So let's keep reading of 11 and 12. So she said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with uh, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? So note how she responds, how her response is similar to Nicodemus. Same idea. When confronted with the reality of Jesus' person, Nicodemus questioned the literalness or the meaning of Jesus' spiritual words, born again. And the first thing that Nicola, uh, Nicholas, Nicoda, uh, Nicodemus thinks of is, well, I can't go into my mother's womb and be born. You know, he, he thinks of it literally. Well, the Samaritan woman examines Jesus' words in exactly the same literal way. She says, I, I don't think you're referring to this water in the well because you have no pot to use and it's deep. So what do you mean by living water? And she's pretty bold because now she actually questions him. You know, she challenges him. Are you even greater than the one who gave us the well originally, Jacob? In other words, he gave us the well which sustains our lives and our animals. Can you give us something that is even greater than this? Well, let's keep reading, 13, it says, Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. So that's the literal water. Then he says, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. So now Jesus points out the difference between the natural water and the living water which He's offering her. Number one, natural water satisfies temporarily, it's earthly, it's natural, it's temporal. Living water, He says, satisfies completely, without end. And whoever drinks natural water will eventually die. It only keeps him alive for so long. But whoever drinks the spiritual or the living water will never die. And so Jesus is the living water. We drink Him in by believing and by obeying His word. That's the connection. And so we go on to verse 15. The woman said to Him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. I was going to say just like a woman, but that would be... <laughs> Notice how her mind works. He's kind of answered, he's, he's put a stop right there. She can't go any further with the questions about the literal water. And so what does she do? She changes the subject. She changes the subject. She, the woman shifts from disbelief and doubt to curiosity. So she, uh, she, comes, uh, she asks him two questions. One, well, could she have this water? And two, if she could, would it mean that she would not have to come out each day at this time to fetch water? And I'll explain that in a, the significance of that in a moment. Verse 16, let's keep going. He said to her, go, call your husband and come here. So Jesus, you know, he, he, uh, he changes the subject too. He was focused on the living water, now, now he's really focused on her. So he says to her, go, call your husband and come, to, and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This uh, you have said truly. So Jesus responds to her changed attitude by delving into a personal life. You know, you want to get personal? Okay, how's this for personal? You've had five husbands and the one that you're with now is not even your husband. 
So she responds honestly and Jesus reacts to her openness by revealing more of his own true nature by showing his intimate knowledge of her past, especially her sinful past. Now this may be why she was alone at noon to draw water. She may have been shunned by the other women of the village because of her background. That's why she was on her own at noon getting water. Also, I want you to note that Jesus offers her the living water or the new birth, but like all others, she needs to begin with faith and repentance. Always the same story, but a different context, different background. So we move on to verse 19 and 20. It says, the woman said to him, sir, I perceived, again, she changes the subject. She changes the subject. She doesn't offer, oh well, but those guys, you know, they left me, or you know, whatever. She, does, she offers no excuses, nothing. She changes the subject. So the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where you ought to worship. So the woman goes from curiosity to a preliminary faith. She sees Jesus as a prophet of sorts, not fully correct, but she's moving in the right direction. Wow, this guy is special, something special about this person. So based on what Jesus has demonstrated, she goes on to ask him a question concerning a major dispute between the Samaritans and the Jews. And the dispute is, where is the right place to worship? Bethel in the north or Jerusalem in the south? Who's right? You know, this is hundreds of years after this has taken place. And so you know, the, 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 the argument continues. Her thinking is that she's been revealed to be a sinner. Where then should she go to be cleansed? To Bethel and see the priests there? Or Jerusalem and offer sacrifice there? You see, people would go to the temple to be cleansed of sin, to offer sacrifice for their offenses. So she wants to know where is the right place to go, north or south. Her conscience has been moved and it is now important for her to know there's a hunger for righteousness. Her meeting with Jesus has sparked this. And without realizing it, she has drunk the living water and it already is having an effect on her. She wants to know, where can I get right? Where's the right place to get right with God? So let's keep reading verse 21 to 24. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father, this mountain. Neither in Bethel, neither north or south is not going to be important. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and His truth. So Jesus responds directly to her question and elaborates on the whole issue of worship that speaks not only to the dispute between the Jews and the Samaritans, but you know, our own problems with this issue today. So now he's not only talking to her, he's talking to us. He says three things about worship. First of all, the time is coming when it will not be important where the physical temple will be located. That's what their dispute was about. We know this is true today because we are the temple in which God dwells, not a building. And it is important where the meeting, it's not important where the meeting places are located. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, you know, Paul says, we're the temple of God. It doesn't matter where you meet, you know, in a building, in a house, this north, south, it doesn't matter. It won't matter. Secondly, the Messiah would come from the southern kingdom, not the north. So as far as the present day dispute between the Jews and the Samaritans were concerned, Jesus tells her that the correct place to worship at that time is Jerusalem. So He solves the issue for her. The Messiah was to come from one of the two tribes of the southern kingdom, and it would be Judah, from the tribe of Judah, not from any of the ten tribes of the north. She asked the question, he gave an answer. And then thirdly, it's not where, 
but how you worship. A person could be in the temple in Jerusalem, but not worship properly if his heart were wrong. If God were physical, then the material would be very important. The place, the time, the things used, so on and so forth, it would be important. But God is a spirit and it is spiritual elements, uh, it's rather the spiritual elements represented by the physical things that are important. For example, singing is physical, but a joyful heart and an understanding heart, that's spiritual. The elements, the bread and the wine that we use, those are physical, but remembering Jesus in loving unity and spiritual truth, that, that's spiritual, that, that's the spiritual part of it. Um, money is physical, but giving generously and joyfully, that's a spiritual thing. Words, the words that I use, the words that we hear, those are physical things. But preaching the word of Christ, teaching Jesus' words, this is spiritual in nature and it's true in nature. So the point I'm making here is that we can do the right things and we can use the right words, but without the right and true spirit, our worship is in vain and untrue as well as unspiritual. So we can be in a church building, we can take the bread and the fruit of the vine, we can say Jesus is Lord, we can sing without an instrument, we can do all those things right, but if our heart's not right, those things don't make it right. So in verse 25 and 26, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, here is the amazing thing right here. He says, I who speak to you am He. Amazing. She is on the verge of realizing the truth about Jesus and she confesses her belief and her hope concerning the Savior to come. Let me explain. The Samaritans believed that the Savior would be a prophet and an earthly ruler like David was. Their name for him was the Restorer or Taheb, they had a specific name for him. But she does not use this term. When she refers to the Savior, she uses a Jewish term, Messiah. Note also how she has gone from rejecting Jesus to voicing her hope in the Savior. The Savior from the South. She didn't mention the Savior that she had been taught coming from the north, she uses the term Messiah, which was a reference to the Messiah that the southern kingdom, that the Jews from Judah anticipated coming. So she's not very far from the truth. Jesus helps her make the connection by declaring to her that He, in fact, is, a, is the Messiah. Just an amazing thing when you think about this. This is the climax of this dialogue and very unusual for Jesus to make this direct and dramatic declaration, think now, to a single person, to one person, let alone a woman and from Samaria. I mean, the apostles were always trying to get information and you know, they couldn't figure it out and so on. And here's this woman from Samaria and he declares to her as an individual, I'm he, I'm the Messiah, wow. And in his answer, he's making her take note that all the things that they hope the Messiah would do, he's already done for her. For example, he has offered spiritual life, and that's exactly what the Messiah was supposed to bring. He has revealed where the true temple should be, and that's exactly what the Messiah was going to do. When the Messiah would come, he would resolve once and for all this argument between north and south. He reveals uh, the heart of men, and that's exactly what the prophets said that the Messiah would do. He knows and reveals what God really wants, true worship, and that's exactly what the Messiah would do when He would come. He reveals Himself as the Messiah, and that's exactly what the Messiah was going to do when He came. He was going to reveal to the world who was the true 
Messiah. So it's like the gospel coming of age in a microcosmic way to one individual. Beautiful story. So by now the apostles return and they make a comment on this strange scene before them Jesus actually speaking to a Samaritan woman. So in verse 27 it says, at this point His disciples came and they were amazed that they had been speaking with a woman, yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city uh, and said to the men, come, see a man who told me all the things that I've done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and they were coming to him. So they voice their surprise at the scene before. Wow, what are, what are you doing talking, you know, what are you doing talking to this woman? Their prejudice showing, up, showing through. The woman, however, seeing the others arrive, leaves everything behind, losing her shame, and tells the others who she believes Jesus to be. On the strength of her witness, the town gathers to see Jesus. And notice she refers to him, she goes to her town people who believe in the northern Messiah, and she says, this, this man that just spoke to me, could he be, quote, the southern Messiah? She uses the term Messiah again. So in verse uh, 31, let's, uh, the Bible tells the story a lot better than I can. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to accomplish His work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, that they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit of life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored, others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. So in the meantime, the apostles want Jesus to focus on eating. They're missing the significance of the moment. Well, of course, they didn't hear what went on. The Lord uses the moment to teach them a lesson based on what has happened. Again, He speaks to them on a spiritual plane, and He says the following. First of all, His satisfaction and theirs comes from doing God's will, not from doing physical things. Living water, bread from heaven, not normal water and normal bread. Secondly, they have to open their eyes and see how hungry and thirsty the people are for the spiritual food that only they have to offer. And boy, there's a lesson there for us today. The world needs the gospel. It needs the gospel in a terrible way. You know, we, we, uh, the, the terrible storms that have taken place, the Red Cross really well equipped to deal with these type of things and you know, the big organizations that specialize in disaster relief, you know, we feel kind of puny, you know, wow, what can we do? You know, give a little money, perhaps somebody went down to help one person clear the debris of their home, so on and so forth. But the thing that we have, nobody else has. Because the Red Cross doesn't preach the gospel, right? Feed the Children, a great organization, but Feed the Children doesn't save souls, it saves lives. So the church has always, in every generation, an important mission, and people are hungry and thirsty for what we have. Thirdly, he says, doing God's will in giving the living water to others also brings great satisfaction. Solomon says, he who wins souls is wise. And joy comes from doing God's will, whatever that is. And he mentions some sow, some reap, but both are rewarded for doing God's will. Of course, this is a preview and a preparation for the great commission that he's going to give them after his resurrection and before his ascension into heaven. You know, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone, Mark 16. Well, this is, you know, he's building up to that. Take a look around you. Look how people are hungry. The point is, even this person who is the furthest away from you culturally and religiously, this person needs the living water. That's the point he's trying to make. Now we don't see the woman again, 
but the living water springing up in her has now given the thirst to those with whom she has shared the story of her encounter with Jesus. So in verse 39, it says, from that city many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things that I have done. So many believed her account and, pursue, uh, and uh, pursued the Lord because of it. Her witness, not her knowledge, not her works, not her teaching ability, is what affected the others. Imagine, her witness was, he knew all my sins. You know, a lot of times we, our witness is, well, I heard the gospel, or my grandma brought me to church, or I was baptized at camp, and the Lord's been good to me, and so on and so forth, but she didn't have anything like that. She said her witness was, well, I, I was divorced five times and even living in sin now, and he knew all about this. And he still talked to me. He still offered me the living water. That was her witness. Isn't that amazing? Verse 40 and 42, so when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. So her witness affected others in particular ways as we wrap up this lesson. First of all, they came to see Jesus for themselves. You know, I've often said in the church, you, know, you, you preach the gospel, you share your faith, and, and, and people will come perhaps to the church to hear the gospel from the pulpit or to, to, to sit in in a Bible class, but the thing that keeps them here is the love of the church, the love of the brethren. That's what keeps them here. They were also prepared to listen. She prepared them for listening. They believed what she said about him after hearing him for themselves. I'll tell you something, people are never disappointed in meeting Jesus. They may be disappointed in us because you know, we're, we're sinners. We're, we imperfectly represent Him many times. But once they get into the Word themselves, once they themselves begin to drink that living water, they're never disappointed. And then finally, they also acknowledge their faith in Him. They said it themselves. Now we know that this one indeed is the Savior of the world. All right, well, we've done a, you know, it was a long, uh, long passage today, but I didn't want to break this up into, into two pieces. So we're going to stop here, and next week we're going to go back to the material to demonstrate a very interesting lesson. We're going to demonstrate Jesus' style of personal evangelism based on this uh, particular passage. Well, that's it for now. Thank you very much.